And here we are, live again. It is June 17th, 2018. This is Martin Sobretti. I'm the Vice President of the Calcedon Foundation, and we're broadcasting live from Georgetown, Texas, with another edition of Calcedon Q&A and Little Meat of the Word. As usual, we allow our uh, tech staff to come ahead and get us connected to the Calcedon website, so people can either view this video here on Facebook or also at calcedon.edu. We also get to the uh, initial questions first that were sent by email to us. If you want to send a question in advance, and that means it gets uh, priority status, first questions uh, to be answered, simply send your question to ask.calcedon at calcedon.edu. And I see uh, Ground Control is in the mix, and they'll let us know just as soon as we are connected to the Calcedon uh, website. Then we can start taking these questions in advance. Uh, we expect not to have any breaks in our sequence until I take my vacation in the summer, which will probably be in September. So we likely will have three in a row where someone else will have to answer the questions. Uh, I wish them well, and it's a, certainly a fun thing to do. Okay, we're good to go. So let's take the first question. This came in from Jordan Wilson. Uh, it's uh, about three paragraphs long, not too long a paragraph, because he sets up his question. The law of God requires equal protections under the law for all persons, whether Hebrew or foreigner. There are many verses which reiterate that there is to be one law for both the Hebrew and for the alien foreigner. Consider also at the same time there were regulations that allow for stricter captivity of foreigners from the nations around Israel, the nations that occupied the promised land which Israel was to take from them. It would seem to me that this unequal protection was related to the Cherim principle, or Cherim principle, how we want to pronounce it, that since the Canaanites were devoted to destruction, in some specific cases, certain liberties could be taken against them that could not be taken against a fellow Israelite. Is this a correct understanding? Now, there's several issues that come to the front here. For example, if we look at um, Deuteronomy 14, there's a passage which is very clear insofar as it makes a distinction between the commonwealth of Israel, what they are expected of them, and what is allowed for someone who is not in their number. It's verse 21, Deuteronomy 14, 21. You shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it unto the stranger that is in thy gates, that he may eat it, or thou mayest sell it unto an alien. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk, etc., etc. The point there being that the Jewish uh, people in the covenant of Israel were not to eat something that died by itself. Uh, they could only eat, say, um, a goat, a lamb, a cow, uh, chicken that had been killed, not one that just was lying there dead. But they could sell it to someone else to eat. So here we have a distinction in the law between uh, the one who is a member of the covenant and those who are not. However, should a foreigner proselytize and become a member of the commonwealth of Israel, then the rule would apply to them and they would not be able to eat something that ate of itself. Rather, they would have to then sell it to someone else. What's the principle here? That outside of the covenant of God, there is still enslavement. There is slavery to sin on all the social, um, physical effects of that sin. Uh, because there's a rejection of God's law and an adoption of some form of autonomy, normally the uh, statist form, uh, with pagan religions and things like that. Therefore, the uh, individual who is outside the covenant of God is, in essence, fair game. He's willing to be enslaved. He's willing to eat something that died by itself, whereas the member of God's covenant would say, no, we're not going to eat the thing that died of itself, but we can sell it to someone who does not have this restriction on them. So in one sense, there is a difference, and it reflects a difference in um, the slave mentality uh, of someone outside the covenant because he's still a slave to sin. There's no provision for his sins or her sins uh, because they've not... Um, glommed on to Israel. There's a fascinating passage in Zechariah where it says uh, ten Gentiles will uh, take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, uh, you know, go, we will go with you because God's with you. You know, it's kind of like show us the ways of God. Uh, and that kind of is what's going to ultimately happen, that, the, that there's an interest in the oracles of God and people want to have them and they will take strong measures to acquire the truth. There's a hunger for, for life and truth and uh, forgiveness and victory in Christ. So this thing is all programmed, if you will, into our world 
but it has yet to be realized. And back here in this period of time, we see there's a distinction being raised. Also, there's an interesting thing about the fact that uh, the Canaanites weren't fully uh, exterminated like they should have been. Uh, the Gibeonites, for example, we have this oddball case where the Gibeonites, they um, deceive Joshua into thinking they weren't Canaanites, that they came some distance away, so they dressed up uh, all dusty clothes as if they had been traveling a far, far distance and claimed as much and acquired under oath to Jehovah a um, covenant of protection, a treaty, uh, secured under false pretenses, yet secured also by an oath to God to perform it. And so at that point, Joshua has a problem. Uh, it was a rash oath because he didn't verify all the facts. Now he's on uh, the hook to handle the Gibeonites properly because God's oath has now constrained him from doing anything that God had previously commanded be done to the Canaanites. Therefore, it became a big issue uh, when, and we mentioned this the last time we spoke here, when Saul decided he was going to take matters into his own hands and retroactively fix Joshua's mistake, and he slew the Gibeonites. And uh, three years of drought were inflicted upon Israel until such time as David sought the Lord in prayer, found out what was the story. There was still blood on Saul and Saul's house. And it took the atonement, if you will, of the slaughter or the execution, really, the judicial execution of the cap for the capital crime of murder of the seven sons of Saul because there was blood on Saul and upon his house, upon his sons. They all had implication, direct implication in the murder of the Gibeonites. So here's a protection to the Gibeonites that's being secured even though they were, in essence, uh, technically outside the covenant. They had been, become uh, implanted into Israel's side, a thorn in the flesh almost, into Israel's flesh. And that stood with God because it was by oath consigned that they were part of that. And so the protection was accorded to them. There's also a fascinating passage uh, in Zechariah 9 talking about the conversion of the Philistine nation. And in the, in the seventh verse, it says that... Uh, Ekron, which is one of the main cities of Philistia, uh, shall be as a Jebusite. Now, what's a Jebusite? The Jebusites were the, uh, uh, the, the interesting story here because there's a confusion. Are they a Canaanite tribe because they're the third son of Canaan, or are they separate from the Canaanite tribes? Uh, even James Orr in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia can't uh, pin this down. He says it looks like both representations may be true. Hello, Mary. Uh, and if that is the case, then we have a situation where the Jebusites re end up being important because uh, it was Arana, the Jebusite, who wanted to donate the land for the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, the, the name from Jerusalem is really based on the name Jibos. Uh, and uh, as the story goes, David would not accept the gift of Arana, the Jebusite. Rather, he said, I will, you know, God forbid that I should offer any burnt offering that costs me nothing. I will surely pay full price for everything here. Even though it was to be donated, the donation was declined, we will pay for this. Uh, because it's something that's important. And it's the tail end, the very last verses of Second uh, Samuel 24, if you want to take a look at that. So Jebusites ended up being an important uh, factor and, in fact, treated as if they were covenant holders in Israel. Now, on the flip side, the very last verse of Zechariah, the same chapter which says that the Philistines will become like Jebusites in, uh, in the house of God. Uh, God will take, he says, God, in fact, will take away the abominations from their, between their teeth and the blood out of their mouth, and they will be converted uh, under these images of uh, the change in the diet and the change in the uh, pagan inclinations and becoming like a Jebusite in the house of the Lord. But at the tail end of Zechariah, we read that shall no more be the Canaanite in the house of the Lord. So the Canaanites will either be fully incorporated into Israel or they won't. But uh, it seems to me that uh, there must, to have justice, justice is to be impartial and to have no respect of persons. And this deals with the interaction between man and man. Uh, and that is the kind of civil justice where there is to be no um, preferential treatment one way or the other. When we have a uh, imposition by God that is by special revelation, like with Canaan, uh, the wars of Jehovah, as they're called, that can create a different picture. But when we had Israel fail of its mission, then essentially a lot of the bets were off as a consequence.
uh, they failed to do what they were told to do. Already out of the box, dealing with the Gibeonites changed the entire dynamics of the situation. And Joshua had to go with the flow. There's no way he can break an oath to God and uh, proceed. That's not going to work. You cannot build God's kingdom by defying the king himself. Next question. It was really uh, drawing my attention to a previous question related to the um, case of someone whose daughter was dating a non-Christian. And uh, the dilemma still stands because I've not yet put up that uh, position paper on the topic. So that's simply, again, she acknowledged, uh, or he, I think, uh, that I am a relatively busy fellow. But I do intend to do this because I don't think I can add too much more than I've already said in the initial um, discussion. And this is certainly mm, five, six, seven weeks ago. So that is still going to be pending for position paper, but I will move it up uh, to the front burner. Uh, the front burner is the better burner to be on uh, in terms of my task list, but it still can take a little bit. But it's, uh, it's because the topic is worthwhile to, to deal with. And then I did, uh, would invite also direct you know, private discussion if that might be potentially helpful. So you can reach out to me via messenger. Uh, okay, then Charles Roberts had asked, what would be the modern application of the city of refuge principle in our society? Uh, he was preparing, I believe, for a discussion on this, and uh, I directed him to Dr. Rush Dooney's uh, commentary, Deuteronomy 19, verses 1 through 10. I'll have Ground Control go ahead and put up the um, post, the, the link, so that the folks can take a look and consult it. But it's a very, very powerful passage in the Deuteronomy commentary, uh, which I happen to have with me. And it, it deals with this, that um, civil justice uh, at the state level is in, not only imperfect, it often is preserving the wrong thing, and therefore you need to have a safety valve, as Rish Dooney puts it, an escape valve for injustice, so that innocent blood not be shed. And that means, thank you, ground control, uh, that means that we recognize that the state is not sovereign and not infallible. In that instance, the church courts uh, and the churches became individual cities of refuge. They were the social um, escape valve uh, as a check on statist overreach, uh, statist excesses, statist um, uh, enormities, as we would say. Now, the problem, of course, in modern America is most people are schooled to think that uh, Constitution first, Bible second famous line from Chariots of Fire when the one English official abrading uh, the runner uh, says, you know, in my day it was king first, God second. Well, that's a quick ticket for that nation to deteriorate and, and be gone <laughs> and to collapse entirely eventually uh, because they're building on the sand if they believe that the uh, king comes before God. So when God is first, what happens? Then it means that the jurisdiction of a church uh, has the authority uh, intrinsically to intervene on behalf of a refuge, refugee uh, and become exactly that city of refuge. I think Rashtuni puts it uh, in an interesting place. Cities of refuge were religious centers in that they were to be governed by God's law in dealing with refugees, and the congregation was to decide each case. Of course, they were Levitical cities, and he says, in the context of our time, we have a growing tyranny because of our growing power states. These states have no regard for God's law. They are increasingly evil. In a Christian state, there should be regional assemblies of appeal to which men may go or to which they can appeal for a restraining order against the state. Now think about that, a restraining order against the state. We can't even get that under humanism with the um, inter International Court at The Hague, <laughs> the UN Court. So there's no such animal as a restraint on the state because each state sees itself as an absolute total God with a capital G. And they see no authority outside themselves. They're at the apex of authority. And therefore, they all represent tyrannies. And the expression of that tyranny culturally depends on how far gone you are from your Christian autopilot upon which that nation was started. If you deviate far enough from it, then you certainly uh, have overt tyranny and uh, dictatorship. <clears throat> and of course, a violation of all liberty of conscience. Or you try to play a game and say, well, we can have the trappings and the facade of uh, legitimacy. But we just saw in the last week where uh, government officials in the current federal administration were arguing that it was the Christian thing to do to always obey the government. So once you're in that boat, you don't need a cities of refuge because the exi existence of cities of refuge is an acknowledgement of the 
um, fallibility of human courts, of the state. It's an indication that the state is fallible, and no state will accept the notion that it is fallible. Uh, they'd rather go to the grave with bad decisions uh, and regard themselves as infallible because they don't want to yield that principle because if they make a mistake, then of course that means perhaps a city of refuge in some way, shape, or form be a good idea. So they redefine right and wrong in terms of the state. And Hitler did this, uh, Stalin did this, FDR did this. If you read the opening uh, preface to uh, Theonomy and Christian Ethics by Dr. Bonson, he provides some quotes from these three rulers, two from uh, uh, obviously tyrannical states and one from our own president during the World War II, indicative that they don't hold to any value or any power or authority outside of the state. The state is everything. And once you have that, there's no city of refuge because there is no place to hide from the raw, naked power of the state. And you're in a world of hurt. So uh, for those interested further in that question and its application to today, by all means, take a look and click on the, the link, which, as I mentioned, I think probably came into play when uh, Charles Roberts was uh, assessing this question a couple weeks ago. And the fourth and last question that came in online. Greetings. This is from Jean Prorock. I have a question about inheritance. If a first-generation believer inherits a piece of real estate after the death of their unbelieving parent, is it to be considered an increase and thus tithed from? It would seem to me, based on the concept of biblical trustee family, that this is not an increase in the family estate, merely it's passing on to the next generation. Is this in any way changed by the fact that the child and the deceased parents stand on the other side of the barricade? Thank you, Jen Perak. So here's an interesting case. We would normally say that in a um, the inheritance being passed on to the next generation, that that increase should already have been tithed upon. That is not the case I would imagine in a, where a non-Christian parent, someone outside the covenant who would see no interest in subsidizing the kingdom of God and acknowledging a tax to God uh, would have yielded anything to God uh, in terms of having this already pre-tithed. So we essentially have untithed capital then being laid up. Now we have the situation now where the wealth of the uh, wicked is laid up for the just. In this instance, God has taken that and moved forward. Think about this for a second. What was the situation with Abraham coming out of Ur the Chaldees? You know, his father was a pagan, and he was first generation born again, in essence. That was uh, Abraham's situation. He was called out of the darkness, but his father remained a pagan. Did that mean that whatever uh, inheritance he gained had to be tithed, or was it the increase on that point forward uh, that a tithe was to be acknowledged. And of course, he understood the concept of the tithe because he did exactly that in Genesis 14 to Melchizedek. So the answer is again that the wealth of the just is laid up for the righteous, but it's not considered an increase. It's truly an inheritance. The meek shall inherit the earth. An inheritance, in essence, is not to be tithed upon. It's not considered an increase per se. It's not part of the... Um, the you're using your, all your might to gain wealth, and then the stuff that was over and above your cost of production would then be given back to God. This does not block a free will uh, return of uh, capital to God. But it certainly is indicative that now you have this capital, and now you're to be certain that it capitalizes the kingdom of God in your generation. So you don't want to have it fall back into the hands of the ungodly, so you're to capitalize your godly seed. We pray, of course, and work for having all of our seed be godly, but only God is in charge of that issue, how that plays out. So I, I would say, no, it, the, uh, it does not need to be tithed on, but it does need to, to be stewarded properly from that point forward, because now you have uh, a gift that's the uh, wealth of the unjust being laid up for the just, and now the just are to use that for a just cause. Uh, to capitalize the kingdom of God, starting with their own godly seed, and then beyond that point. So you see to your own house, and then to uh, other issues. And, and that's important, because in essence, it all goes back to where it came from. Nobody has anything that they didn't get from God. Even what your deceased parents have came from God in the first place. Whether they acknowledged it or not, that was the case. So, uh, I think that is the basic thing. Now, I am open to 
possibility that there could be an alternate way to look at it, but the there is no proper increase per se. Again, it is a possession of the family, and it is simply then divided among the heirs. So it's more of a dividing, and I, whether you're the firstborn or not might determine whether you get a double portion. And certainly under secular uh, ideas, unless there's a tr family tradition to do that, you're not likely to get it. In fact, you tend to get a very willful division of proceeds uh, uh, outside of the kingdom of God. You know, it's the person you prefer. Uh, it's the um, I've even seen last-minute changes in wills that were very much a bad idea by a Christian who, one could argue, was not in his right mind at the time due to um, senile dementia or things like that. Nonetheless, the final form of the will stood, and it ended up harming the family's uh, inheritance as a consequence. So the process of inheritance beyond this point should be a Christian one. Uh, so you have a starting point, and then you move forward from there. It's future-oriented at that stake. So that capital ought to be put to work for God's kingdom uh, at the family level and then beyond. So let's see. Uh, were there any questions pending? I'll scroll back and see. I saw lots of folks telling me they're watching. I'm from Appomattox. Hi, folks. Uh, it looks like uh, we're very lean on questions so far. I was uh, interviewed yesterday um, for, for two hours for a video that was kind of an interesting video um, where we spoke a lot about the foundation of Christian Reconstruction. And so if we have a little dead space, I might talk about some of the things that were brought to light in the course of that discussion. But here we looks like we have an online question. Is it scriptural? Let me hit the see more button here. To effectively excommunicate someone from your life if the local church has not or won't do so, since too few churches even evaluate behavior based on the Word of God, is this a proper course or recourse? Well, we certainly have what's known as the right of free association. And if it is your con contention that someone uh, is in such gross sin uh, that they should be have been rejected by the church and the local church is not doing this, uh, you uh, and you know them to be bad company, as a consequence, uh, unrepentant. Uh, know this, that one of the um, values of uh, church excommunication is that it usually has an effect on the excommunicated person. Their conscience is to be pricked by that. Uh, their awareness that their people are not uh, fellowshipping with them. And that loss in someone who can be reached by that uh, uh, works on the heart uh, and causes a repentant spirit to emerge. Sometimes it hardens the heart, but the de desire. And we even have commented on this fact in Second Corinthians when Paul deals with the person who was excommunicated in First Corinthians 5. We know for a fact from that passage that it was not a complete and total excommunication. Not everyone accepted Paul's advice. There were those who were opposed to Paul, just in principle. They were just fighting him tooth and nail and creating grief for him. And they weren't willing to go along with the excommunication. But there was enough that went along with it that it had an effect on the individual. So if you are a one-man excommunicating body, and it's just you breaking fellowship and the rest of the church not, I don't believe that you're going to necessarily have a desired effect on that person, other than that you're standing alone on principle. And uh, that means that you also become a walking indictment of the church that refused to do it. Uh, and you will probably pay a price for that. Most churches will not tolerate that. Now, they might say, you need to be brought up on charges because you're not treating party X in a Christian-like way. You're, they'll imagine that you're violating the principle, uh, as so far as it's possible, and lieth with you, be at peace with all men, you're not at peace with this person. And you give, give your rules. We already adjudicated that. Uh, so they're not willing to listen because they don't want problems. Uh, and so they're going to not let you re- uh, try the case, even if it deserves to be retried. They're going to say you're out of order, etc., etc. So uh, it is something that you can do because you can certainly protect you yourself and your family from fellowship that you regard as uh, morally dangerous. You know, uh, bad company corrupts good morals, and you cannot bring fire into your bosom without being burned. There are all these principles that say we do dissociate and disfellowship uh, and it can be done at the personal level if it can't be done at the church level. But be aware that the church who does not think anything has been done wrong 
may decide that now you're the troublemaker because you're drawing attention to the church's failure, assuming you're on the right, the church's failure to discipline properly. Uh, the church wants the problem to go away. And one of the ways the church makes the problem go away is hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. All of a sudden, if you're doing a one-man excommunication, you're speaking evil just by your conduct. And that means that the, the, uh, a lot of churches think nothing is more important than unity. It's even more important than holding to, uh, fast to the Word of God. So consider that you might pay a price for being faithful to God. And if that's good for you, I think that uh, it'll work out in God's good order. But be prepared to, to pay a price. It is uh, We live in a world where everything except the Word of God and its requirements are prioritized, where lawlessness and looseness of application of Scripture is king, because supposedly this is a matter of uh, grace. You need to be gracious as opposed to being concerned with the soul of the individual <laughs> uh, who is not getting any uh, pushback for their conduct. Uh, there might be unrepentant uh, sin there. There might be unrestituted uh, funds that need to be paid back, etc., etc. And that's not going, and that's going to go well for the soul of the individual and for the church. The church will suffer as a consequence. So you may need to actually look at your church relations as well in this light. This church is not willing to um, excommunicate uh, uh, a member that has gone south to recover him. I can't expect any better. I suppose if I did something as wrong as that individual did, they won't, they'll won't. they wink at that too, wink at my sin. And uh, the, one of the main points in the second greatest commandment, it's embedded in a passage in Levit uh, Leviticus 19 that says, you will not hate your neighbor in your heart. You will uh, in any wise rebuke him. You don't let the sin stand on his head. So uh, it is a requirement not to wink at the sin and just pretend like nothing happened. So the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil approach to church unity is a uh, recipe for disaster, moral disaster, ecclesiastical disaster, and ultimately cultural disaster, because the, if the church can't speak even to its own, how can it speak to the culture and have a prophetic voice there? If you can't have a prophetic voice within the congregation of the saints who have the spirit, then how are you going to speak to the world at large? Joy Ike asks, Sell what you have and give alms, Leviticus 12.33. What is the root of this in the law, and how does it mesh with tithing and caring for children and elderly parents? Let me, I'm surprised I didn't, um, I don't know if we had Mark get up through that passage in his survey of uh, Luke. He may have. Ground control may recall. 12.33. Of course, this was in, uh, in 22. It was something that he gave to the disciples. Um, so there's certainly a contextual restraint here. But I believe this is very much different um, than the situation in Mark 10 uh, of the rich young ruler who was commanded to sell all that he gave because he lacked one of the things that was laid out by the Lord Jesus. Uh, of the commandments that Jesus laid out, one of them was not in the Ten Commandments. It was um, aposteresis in the Greek, which means do not um, defraud. And it's, that use is for violation of the poor tithe specifically. Now, the interesting thing is um, he was therefore to... Uh, there would have been a fourfold restitution under the, that case in Mark 10, the Mark 10 case, where he was to sell all he had and give it back to the poor. And then restitution would have been arrived at. Zacchaeus had the same situation. Everyone he defrauded, he paid back fourfold. In the case of the rich and ruler, uh, aggravating circumstances placed it so that all he had uh, was what required to be sold and given to the poor to meet the restitution amount, and because he was guilty of the fraud. And that was the one thing that he lacked in the list that Jesus gave. He said, oh, all, you've, all these things I've done for my youth. And Jesus said, no, one of these you lack. Go, therefore, and sell all that you have and give it back to the poor. And then you shall have... But as long as he was un, unrepentant, he refused to do that. And he went away very sad. And we see the just a few verses later, the poor widow throwing only two mites into the treasury temple, uh, treasury of the temple. Uh, it should be noted that at the Maccabean period, 
just 150, 70 years before, Israel had wiped out all poverty. They had realized the promise of Deuteronomy 15.4, that you shall have no more poor among you if you keep the poor tithe requirements, and they did. Uh, they had a surplus of money uh, accumulated at the central temple, 200 talents of gold, 600 talents of silver, uh, according to the, um, the book of Maccabees, I mean, 2 Maccabees 3. And so this excess was there because they had no poor people to give it to. But as is usual, people start to sit on their lees and they, stop they start to disobey and they start to grind the faces of the poor, which is what happens according to Isaiah, first chapter, when you don't take care of the poor, when you ignore the poor tithe. And boom, we're in that situation again. And the rich young ruler was one of these. Now, this is a little bit different because this is give alms. Alms are always a free will offering. So the case is not the same as in Mark 10. Uh, and I think he's simply inviting um, prolific giving and generosity and that this should mark the heart. Uh, like the Proverbs 31 woman, she extends her hands to the poor and the needy. This is what marks her. She, uh, In fact, that's the reason, like about two weeks ago we talked about, why is there a um, provision in the law of God that allows the father to overrule in a vow of the daughter within 24 hours. And what is that vow? The specific ordinance had to do with her promising to give God a gift over and above what God requires. That's the only vow that she, that the father uh, and the husband could subvert and release the wife or the daughter from. And what does it do to? Because the woman is compassionate and cares and zealous for God and his cause. So too, this is an invitation, this passage in Luke 12, to go ahead and be generous and uh, and to give the alms uh, and not to be worried about things that God will then in turn provide. Um, I will probably re reach this question again next week when we visit this. I'll just do a little extra study just to make sure of my grounds on this. But I'm fairly certain um, because alms are mentioned uh, and not specifically the poor tithe per se, which is a matter of defrauding, and that term is not it doesn't appear in this passage in Luke. In fact, it's a very, very long discussion with the disciples, not with one individual who said, what must I do to inherit eternal life, as the rich young ruler was in Mark 10. So very different cases, and let me parse this out in a little bit more detail. Uh, I'll consult some of my big fans up there. Uh, Hendrickson on, on Luke would be a good source, uh, and Godet and others that I have on the shelf. Let's see here. Yeah, there's an interesting thing. And Mark has... Um, did deal with it. So I also, uh, Ground Control was kind enough to pull up the sermon that uh, Mark did, a Sunday sermon, from Chalcedon Chapel on this very topic. I thought he had already passed down through this uh, passage before, and I think he's got a good um, area to talk about that. So by all means, if you want to get a little bit more detail, and I will consult that myself just to refresh my memory, because Mark has a couple of sources I don't have, and vice versa. So between the two of us, I think we'll have a, a pretty good uh, revisiting of this topic next week. Roberto asks, Speaking of the poor tithe, what is the percentage that should be given? Is it only after 10% is tithed? Well, the principle is that there's a full tithe to be given every third year. Now, uh, and it's to be given eye to eye. This is discussed in detail in Tithing and Dominion by Powell and Rushtuni. So that'd be the place to go for the details. The main thing is that the community does it, and it improves community. There's, it's amazing to me how many parts of the law of God actually improve the relationship between man and man, man and woman, women and woman. Um, for example, why is it that you're supposed to, when you see your enemy's ox wandering around, you're supposed to return it to your enemy? Well, part, God has several motives, but one of the things that can't be missed is that now there's a sense of community between you and your enemy. You've done some good to your enemy. You brought the ox back. You did not uh, rejoice at your enemy's loss of the ox. Rather, you took the trouble to take the animal all the way back to your enemy. And like Rashtuni says, community is one of the big things that God's law is all about, rebuilding it from scratch, especially when it's been broken or ruptured in any way, shape, or form. So to here, we have the same thing. Community is built between those who have and those who have not in the community. Uh, and also is built because now it's not that you're entitled to that money, certainly not from the st impersonal state, but rather that uh, there is a grace being manifested in the community toward the poor, and they observe and discharge God's law toward the poor, which is designed to do what? Eradicate poverty. You shall have no more poor among you. Deuteronomy 15.4.
The fact that Jesus makes the comment, you will always have the poor among you, which is a contemporaneous comment to the Jews of the time, his own generation, is an indication of their faithlessness and their refusal. They were marked by the same attitude as the, as the ruler of Mark 10 who walked away unhappy because he didn't want to do anything that would restore properly to the poor what had been deprived of them through fraud by refusing to pay the poor tithe. And it's one of the most commonly forgotten tithes. And what happens is that we forget it, we forget it, we forget it, and it looks like God's not uh, enforcing it. And so we become reinforced uh, and uh, strengthened in our knowledge that God doesn't seem to care. He's not enforcing this law anymore. And we're very, very wrong about that. And a culture that um, refuses to do that then will set up potentially uh, statist solutions to the poor poverty, the poverty problem, a war on poverty, and be spending 20%, 20 to 21% of your income to fight poverty and never solve it, versus 3.3% of your annual increase and actually solve it God's way. Because it doesn't take a lot to solve poverty under God's law. Uh, God has portioned out everything in this creation of his so that he knows better than anybody what it takes to solve a problem. Uh, that sin brings into the picture, or that even um, natural evils can bring into the picture. Storms and droughts and floods and things in this order, uh, we can always recover from these if we observe God's law wisely in respect to them. Here's another submitted question. When listening to a news report about some occurrence, it is important to consider the source in terms of its reliability. After all, won't someone's adherence to God's law color the way any situation is addressed? Okay, I like this question because uh, it is certainly possible for a terrible news source to get the truth. Uh, it was funny, I just had a conversation in the last 24 hours where the, someone told me, it looks like there was a concerted uh, effort to oppress American black farmers by refusing to give them the various handouts and subsidies that the white farmers had and then to continually harass them with all sorts of regulatory investigations that the white farmers didn't have, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I said, what was the source for that? And they said, NPR. And I said, I am not surprised. Now, the person said, well, what are you not surprised at? And I said, I'm not surprised that the government would do that. She, and she thought, oh, I thought you were going to say you're not surprised it came from NPR. Uh, NPR can certainly tell the truth. Now, they have an ax to grind. They want to promote a Marxist status solution to this problem, right, as opposed to a biblical solution. But it doesn't mean that the fact itself that's being reported is inaccurate. We know, uh, just going back through the easy chair discussions uh, with uh, Otto Scott and Rush Dooney, they spoke about the uh, initiative put starting with the uh, Lyndon Johnson administration, where the... Uh, um, Department of Agriculture decided we have three million farms. We need to reduce that to one million farms. We need to push to make two million farms just go away. And that uh, there's a and since those would be smaller farms, the likelihood is that those might have been farms owned by African American uh, farmers and not by uh, Caucasian American farmers. What do you want? Whatever hyphenation you want to use. The point is. There was such a program in place. It was an initiative from on high to make American agriculture more efficient. And if the black farmer was on the receiving end of the worst of that, that was fine because the end justifies the means, according to the Department of Agriculture. So it could be that the news was accurate, even though almost everything that I hear on NPR, I always have to say, now, am I being fed a bill of goods? <laughs> because they're not trustworthy. Paul makes this comment also about... Um, Cretans, you know, they're liars. You know, so you have to take something a grain for a salt if you have a, a situation where they're not trustworthy. Who has believed our report? Here's a situation in uh, Isaiah 52, 53, where the report is true, but no one wants to believe it. In this case, the report of the Messiah coming. So, yeah, I, I do take it with a grain of salt, but that doesn't mean that a... Uh, a Someone who has an axe to grind isn't telling the truth about something. Uh, the truth can come from very, very strange um, situations where you wouldn't expect it. And this is why the saying is still true. There's a certain kind of evil only a good man can do. What's that mean? There's a certain kind of evil only a good man can do. Because a good man, we defer to them, we trust them. We implicitly say, this man is proven, he's gold, he's, a, he's the gold standard. 
I can trust him, everything he says. And so we don't necessarily are, are become Berean with everything out of his mouth. We might accept what he says because he's a good man. And therefore, if he goes south and makes a terrible mistake and, and gives counsel that is wrong, harmful, it's because he's a good man and we trust him that we say, well, he's a good man. And I instantly, automatically trust him. And so that shorthand of saying we can trust this source is a dangerous place because everything has to be checked out. We can trust nothing except the Word of God. Everything else has, is open to fallibility and is open for misunderstanding. And so we need to double check everything, triple check it. Uh, and not just because it came from a source that we trust. It's possible for Chalcedon to propagate error. It's possible for American Vision to propagate error. It's possible uh, for seminaries to do so. I think many of them do uh, propagate error uh, and don't uh, provide adequate checks against their own excesses. So what's the requirement? We must apply Isaiah 8.20. To the law and the testimony, to speak not according to these is because there's no light in them. So this applies to news reports. If they're not accurate, or more to the point, it is true so far as it goes, but they left out this important part. Ah, so then the news, um, that's why on a court oath, we usually hear the phrase, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That part about the whole truth is key, because uh, you can s supply half the truth, and there might be a mitigating factor, a qualifier in there, that uh, is omitted, and can make some, the situation look the exact opposite of what it actually is. And, by the way, the reason that we're glommed onto these news people is that statism is very intent on controlling the narrative because they live and die by the narrative that is accepted by the bulk of the people. And if you don't accept the narrative, then you are an extremist, you are a revisionist, um, and you are a crackpot, and uh, you need to be discredited, and you need to be labeled so that we can quickly dismiss anything that you have to say because it contravenes the party line. So uh, if you float a counter-narrative, and God in Christ has floated the most profound counter-narrative in history, one that will actually uh, uh, alter everything and pull everything into its orbit, it is a stone made without hands that will crush and grow into a mountain and to crush and destroy all the other kingdoms and send them shattering as chaff in the wind, and that they cannot be found anymore. Uh, that counter-narrative that Christ is setting in motion in history will dominate. It's actually the true narrative and the truth will be victorious. That's why I always like the way that um, Matthew 12, 20 reinterprets the prophecy of Isaiah 42, verse 4. In the original, it says, The Messiah, he shall lead justice to truth. When it's quoted by Matthew, Jesus says, He shall lead, the Messiah shall lead justice to victory. Truth and victory are correlates. The truth will be victorious. What is the word truth? In the Old Testament, Jesus says it's victory. So there's no question that the truth will come out. It'll be shot from the rooftops, ultimately we've been told that. So we don't have to fear for that. But we do need to be aware that we um, people can manipulate us with their stories, with their narratives. Uh, it, it, it can be a powerful thing if it's the truth that's sending a wave or a, a torrent of uh, action-mindedness into people's hearts, stirring them up. But if it's a lie, you know, lynch mobs have arisen out of lies. Oops, I guess we shouldn't have killed that person. Uh, now the truth is out. It was a, a perjured testimony or misidentification. Dangerous things happen when people run with something that's not true. Or apply the law of God improperly with the truth. It's always possible to have the truth and to use it unrighteously. Uh, that's why this question always arises. What about Rahab and uh, the... Hebrew midwives, they refuse to tell the truth to people who would use it for evil. It's because the status authorities had forfeited the right to the truth because they would use it to propagate evil. So let's see what's next here. Oh, there's a final question? That's odd. I didn't know we are moving so fast. <laughs> Maybe you don't mean in the sense of time, but last question submitted online. Let me make sure I can see the whole thing. Yes. Why do you think Many who hold an opposing view to the law of God seem to be on the cutting edge of issues relating to health and wellness, while upholding things like abortion, euthanasia, and homosexuality. Well, one possibility is man-centeredness. If we have an anthropocentric orientation, that man is all-important, 
then things like health and wellness relate to the man. And we're more interested, therefore, in the things of the body, man's body being seen basically as a, an intelligent animal, the naked ape, as Desmond, Mor Desmond Morris, I think, called him in his book title. Uh, and therefore, if you are centered on man, then only things of man are important. The main business of uh, humanism is, is you know, man is to measure all things, Protagoras, I think, said that. And that's the whole point of humanism. So in essence, the, the reason that that's the case is that they're putting man first in all these categories. Therefore, man's convenience is made important with abortion and euthanasia and homosexuality. We want to have, uh, have uh, license and libertinism so that man is not restrained in any way, shape, or form because we put man first. In a theocentric situation, man is under God and God is placed first. Uh, and that changes things up significantly. Now, what often happens is that we have them ahead of us in certain areas of knowledge and research because too many people who put God first put nothing second, as opposed to saying, God's first, and that's going to shape everything I'm going to do. I'm going to be the best uh, health and wellness practitioner I can be under God. I'm going to investigate ways to improve the health of man. Uh, but we don't have that by and large. The number of Christian physicians is dwindling and has never been large. Uh, it seems that going through some of these secular schools takes its toll um, because they push the evolutionary message over and over and over again, uh, passing through medical school, etc. And that's the price that you have to pay uh, for your soul. You're going to have to give up your soul, if you will, uh, to go down some of these paths. But if Christians decide, well, we're going to supposed to take every thought captive to the beings of Christ, and all things are to be in subjection to him, as Hebrews asserts, then our mission is, therefore, to take all these thought captives, to be excellent experts on the area of health and wellness. Well, Rush Juni has a book we just recently published, it, I think last year, if not 2016, it was 2017, one of those two years, um, about health and wellness. It's all of his medical reports, uh, that were published in the Chalcedon Report over a span of a couple of decades, all accumulated in one place, in one handy book. That's indicative of the relationship of Christianity to the medical profession, to the health um, professions, and the fact that a doctor stands in a Levitical or a priestly role in culture. Uh, it's fascinating some of the things that arise when you apply biblical law and biblical categories to the medical profession. Uh, for we have this, in um, modern corporations, we have the notion of the limited liability corporation. Uh, and that's not biblical, limited liability. The Bible has the position of full liability. You're fully liabil liable for everything that you do. In other words, to the to extent of the liability, uh, restitution requires that you be the liable party and responsible. That's what we mean by liability. Under modern medical notions in the 20 and 21st century, we have this new idea, humanistic, called infinite liability. The doctor has infinite liability because he must be infallible and make no mistakes. And if he makes a mistake, he is to be destroyed at all costs. And uh, he'll have everything taken away from him and potentially jailed uh, for an error. So we expect infallibility uh, from doctors. We have limited or no uh, um, liability for people in the corporate world, and the Bible is sitting there in the middle with full liability. So the Bible is a pox on both your houses, both the medical profession for holding this impossible standard of infinite liability, and to the limited liability corporation because it, whatever you uh, subsidize, you incentivize. And if you uh, to remove responsibility from the operation of a corporation, it is now incentivized to do wrong things because people are insulated by the corporate veil. Oh, there's no more questions? Tell me about the interview yesterday. Uh, so the, uh, it's a project involving the um, interviewing of various Reconstructionist leaders and explaining uh, so that people can understand all the aspects of the Reconstructionist program and where it fits in. What, uh, where, where does Reconstruction start, for example, was one of the opening questions. It starts with the individual. As I pointed out, uh, uh, you who say, do not steal, do you steal? We, hypocrisy is a completely inadequate foundation to reconstruct anything. You cannot solve someone else's problem until you solve your own problem. And so the individual has to be reconstructed first. Self-government prior is primary under God. Then we can talk about the families. Then we can move out from the families to the churches. Strong, reconstructed families can make strong, reconstructed churches. And always with Christian self-government at the core of that process. 
And the very last thing to be looked at is the civil government. And in many ways, it should be the least of the governments. And I said, our big mistake often is to uh, be confused with social theory. And as if we were a political movement, I said, the whole idea of reconstructing from the top down was dealt a fatal blow in Second Chronicles you know, 34 with the case of Josiah. Here we had a tremendous amount of Christian reconstruction being done from the top down. Very popular leader who put this great Passover on and uh, was destroying the high places, etc., etc. But he missed a few things, and those few things that he missed were fatal. Uh, he accumulated the chariots and the horses that Deuteronomy 17 said he was not to have. And then he launched a preemptive war against Egypt while Egypt was going to smite Carchemish. And therefore, the king was killed, and within two kings down the line were Zedekiah, and the downhill slide to Babylon is complete. So, reconstruction must start the individual, it cannot be hypocritical. And in this case, the weakness of the guy at the top affected everybody. It was a skin-deep reconstruction. Now, what's a valid reconstruction? Nehemiah talks about that, where the heart of the people were in it, where they were literally building rock by rock around the Jerusalem domain, building it for future growth. That was what you need to have, someone who's willing to take the time and trouble to start with the foundational work. And I think one of the things that I saw uh, during the course of my interview that's significant is when does God respond to us? In Haggai, we have the complaints, well, you know, we have a hole in our purse and we looked for much and found little. In other words, it looks like God's cursing us with non-productive fields and uh, our business ventures are doing poorly. And God says, because you guys dwell in sealed houses and my house lays waste. I am sorry, I should have, I forgot to turn my uh, Do Not Disturb on today. And uh, that's a mistake I made, and that's why we had a sudden interruption. One of my sons wanted to wish me happy Father's Day. I'll need to take that call a little later. Uh, so, okay, um, getting back to the topic, the, uh, which now I've forgotten. <laughs> Uh, but it was a good topic, by the way. Thank you, uh, Ground Control, for bringing us the Faith and Wellness Connection. You can read the entire text of that book uh, online uh, at that point. Let me see if I can recover uh, what I was saying. Oh, where and how these interviews will be published. Um, they will actually be turned into a film that uh, I understand is expected out the last quarter of 2019. And uh, the rest of the details are murky because they're just getting started. I think I was the second individual interviewed, uh, but there's going to be a lot more being interviewed coming up. So uh, I think it's going to be an exciting little project and another way to, um, where someone who has a heart for this thing, uh, for the idea of bringing the, uh, the Word of God in its fullness to the people um, and to overcome objections. And that's part of the process. So in essence, it was as if I had a two-hour Q&A yesterday as a warm-up to today's Q&A. But uh, yeah, that's when they'll be published. And uh, as soon as we get closer to that, um, I'm certain that uh, the producers will go ahead and uh, get the... It was interesting. They had us um, do the interview at the Georgetown County um, or City Courthouse, historical courthouse downtown Georgetown, which is a building that was erected in the mid-1800s. And so we actually had the, in the place of law is where I was interviewed and uh, where the law perhaps was better observed in terms of reference to biblical law a hundred years ago than today, because now humanistic law, positive law prevails. And that's the big failure that we have. Ground control, how are we doing on uh, time on our, our mission today? Well, 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 well. And if nobody, I have still nine live viewers. If anyone wants to ask a question, now's the time to do it. And if not, then, then not. And uh, by the way, when we were um, had this interview yesterday, it's interesting because the there are so many folks who don't understand the full extent of post-millennialism. Uh, it's like we absolutely have to have a failure at the end of history or this, oh, Shelby has a question. And those are always the toughest questions, my dear sister Shelby. What can you ask me, Shelby, that won't make me look bad? 
feel free. And I don't know if there's any latency or delay, but um, you might be typing it up as we wait. Kevin is with us. Ah, is it feasible that rape is primarily a Sixth Commandment violation rather than a Seventh Commandment violation? I will give you a verse to support this idea. Okay, if we're going to talk about that intense a topic, we're not going to be able to do justice to it in the remaining six or seven minutes. Um, because I'm going to want to, but go ahead and provide the verse so everyone can understand what we'll be grappling with next week. We'll put this on the top of the list alongside the other question that we discussed. Ah, uh, there's a difference. The, the Luke asked an interesting question, and I'll take that. The present, the, pre, the law that you're talking about, Luke, which uh, is in Deuteronomy 22, verses 6 and 7, it's to protect the species. If you take the eggs and the mom, at that point, we have the, uh, the potential that the species itself will be extinct, and God's law is structured as to prevent that from happening. So if you only take the eggs and the mom, the dam is the word used in the Old Testament, is then capable of um, having another generation of birds, and the species will still be uh, intact and preserved rather than destroyed for all time and denied to the post our posterity. So, uh, and th this is what's interesting to me, because there's a preservation of the species, uh, it might be a factor in this, that that law ends with the promise that your land, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord God giveth thee. It matches almost word for word the promise with the fifth commandment to honor your mother and your father. So, uh, it's a fascinating passage in respect to that. And that would be the least of the commandments. And so, I don't think it relates necessarily to the, the bear situation. Um, with the bears, so long as the uh, cubs have been weaned, you could certainly shoot the mom, I, I suppose. I mean, it's still it's a brutal thing, but if here's an area where man and nature is at war because man is at war with God and is lawless. This relationship between man and nature will change as the post-millennial situation slowly comes to bear century after century, no pun intended, then the promises of Isaiah 11 will prevail, where you know the young child can play on the uh, hole of the asp and the basilisk and the cockatrice's den. And then the, 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 we see that they shall neither hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So man being at odds with nature and vice versa is a thing put set in motion by the fall. And as the curse is being reversed over time through the pouring out of God's spirit upon all flesh, a change in nature arises. Not only that leads to longer lifespans, as indicated in Isaiah 65, but also the relationship with nature itself. So as when Rushton talks about Romans 8, 19 to 23 in his commentary on Romans, he gets down to the nitty-gritty, agreeing with Calvin that not only is um, the animal domain to be uh, completely uh, resurrected and restored, but even the mineral domain, because the things of the world, the rocks of the basement, rocks of the earth, all they are uh, afflicted and in f um, vanity and futility because of sin. They rust and they rot and they decay. And all these things that are present in today's world are an effect of, the, of, of uh, sin, just like death is. And all this is to be reversed by the preaching of the law of God. And Rashtuni does an exposition of that in his passage of the book of Romans, uh, Romans 8, 19 to 23. Uh, very, very powerful passage. Yeah. Okay, Deuteronomy 22. Let me just check this here. And there's a see more. Okay, so you're going to tie this passage uh, back to the which of the two commandments. So we will take this as, I think, the second question next week and uh, see if we can't share some biblical light on it. So I think we're going to go ahead and close it, but thanks for sharing that, and I will see the entire thing online when I uh, pull that up. Uh, right now I can only see the first four lines, but I'll look up the entire passage in Deuteronomy 22, 27, then we'll take a look at the question that was raised by Shelby on the question of rape. Um, one of the more serious things that the scriptures do talk about. Uh, because God made man upright, 
but men sought out many devices, Ecclesiastes tells us. And we live in that era where men continue to think they have temporary success with the many devices that they have innovated. And God is not mocked. You will always sow what you reap. So it's better to reap wisely. To that end, we'll go ahead and close this issue of uh, Cal Student Q&A. Uh, thank you. Cal Student Foundation, Ground Control sent me a question in its entirety, and I'll review the stack and make sure the two questions that we left open-ended today uh, as requiring additional time will become the first questions for next week. We'll see you all then. God bless everyone, and we'll catch up with you then. Bye-bye.